I wanted to put a face and a name behind patient number three. I wanted to be able to connect with people and tell them that this is real, that this healing is real. And that's what I do every day. Our next guest has one of the most inspiring stories that you likely have ever heard. She is someone who just six years ago was on the brink of death, but changed course and healed 26 illnesses by changing her diet and lifestyle. Valerie Ann Smith, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm honored to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, tell us your story, Valerie. I, I you know, obviously you've been on a number of other podcasts and that's how we found out about you. Uh, but you have such an amazing, you know, kind of comeback story. I think anybody who, you know, roots for the underdog would be rooting for you. What is your story? Um, I'm glad to share it. Um, I uh, suffered for many, many years um, with mental illness. And as a young child, Things weren't right. I knew that. Um, I know it now. Of what was going on metabolically, nutritionally, uh, mentally, physically, but I didn't know it then. And as a young child, I was kind of frail and sickly. I had gone through a lot of antibiotics um, for different illnesses, including mononucleosis as a sixth grader. Uh, that was misdiagnosed for many, many weeks. And so they kept trying different antibiotics to fix me. And it ended up not being something that could be fixed with antibiotics. And I um, was diagnosed at 12 with um, an ulcer, which reflects how much anxiety and depression I had as a youngster. Even before I had any official mental illness diagnoses, I just was a very sad and depressed and anxious child. So what went on was at 12, 13, 14 years old, right at the start of puberty, I felt very out of control. I felt that my life was swirling around me and I couldn't control anything. My anxiety increased, my depression increased. I developed OCD at that point and was you know, doing those sorts of habits, counting, locks, checking, the, the normal sort of obsessive compulsive disorders to try to bring order to your life and to try to deal with the stress and release stress. It was about that time that uh, when puberty started and I was already not having a good relationship with my biological father who left when I was very young, I began to have a lot of self-hatred, a lot of self-punishment issues. And that's when the anorexia started. I thought that if I lost some weight that um, I would attain some unconditional love from those who I felt like I could not get it from. I had love in my life. I had family that was supportive. My mother, my grandparents, I was very close with them. But a lot of times the, the, it's, it's the squeaky wheel that causes the disruption. You can have nine people in your life that are supporting you, but that one person um, rejects you and it can affect you deeply. And as a child, we don't filter that in the same way that an adult can process it. An adult can look at that other adult and say, this is a problem with you and not with me. This is your behavior and, and your belief and your inability to love, and it has no reflection on me. When it's a child, 
that reject, rejection gets internalized. And so the first thing a child thinks is, what is wrong with me? Why am I not lovable? Why am I not worthy of love? So that's the kind of firestorm that was going on in my life that started the drive to starve. But it wasn't an innocent, um, just go on a diet and lose a few pounds and change the way I look and just go back to who I was before. It was a neurological issue that drove me to starve because of my malnutrition. And it took a hold of me so strongly that there was no walking away from it. So by the time I was 14 or 15, I had um, skipped enough meals at breakfast and lunch unbeknownst to my family and still was having supper with the family. And that was beginning to be affected because I was no longer able to eat a whole meal, not allow myself to eat a whole meal at supper anymore. Every bite that went in my mouth was recorded. I obsessively um, memorized calorie counting books and kept notebooks and each day and each week I would strive to go lower with the calories. And by the time I was that age, 14 or 15, right in there, I had lost enough weight on uh, less than seven or 800 calories a day, picking through fruits and vegetables because by that time, at that age, I had already pushed out protein and fat as the first things to go. So that's all I was subsisting on was mostly vegetables like spinach and celery, the ones that have the most volume for the lowest calorie um, and some fruit. So enough weight had been lost that my family became alarmed. And uh, at that point, um, I'm 5'9". And when this started, I was around 130 pounds. And at 15 or 16, I had gotten down to 105. And that was when my family said, you either have to stop this, even though we've talked about it over and over and over again, you have to stop this or we're gonna have to do something. We can't go on this way. At that point, more began to happen mentally. And that was when the schizoaffective disorder started. And it tormented me. Those voices tormented me to a point where I, I could not function. I spent most of my day either crying, um, trying to get through the day. It was summer in between school years. And I would cry because I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to go to school. I just, I just couldn't function. This male voice, this audible voice that I heard in my head would not only scream evil at me, it would scream incessant messages of paranoia that I couldn't trust my family that people or strangers were watching me, that there were things that I needed to do to myself or to others in order to remain safe. And my only escape was sleep. That was the only time I could ever quiet the voices. Other than that, when I was awake, they were screaming. And I liken it to a, a movie where a set of people is trying to get information from someone and they're blaring lights and music and voices at them 24 hours a day to try to get them to break. That's what this felt like. It was so loud. Like someone was literally screaming just two inches away from my face all the time. It was awful. 
absolutely awful. At 16, I was placed inpatient for the very first time. I didn't want to go, but I also, at that point, had lost hope in ever being free from any of this. So the first thing that happens in patient uh, for eating disorders, especially, is um, a nasogastric feeding tube, an NG feeding tube. And um, they are pushed through your system um, six times a day, three meals and three snacks. And they're very inflammatory ingredients. There's nothing nutritious about them. And they're not only used then, but they're, they're the basic building blocks to um, a children's nutrition boost drink. They're the basic building blocks to ensure and boost for older adults and seniors and in rest homes or anyone that's gone through any kind of surgery that needs quote unquote nutrition. But it's nothing nutritious. It's high fructose corn syrup, canola oil, and soy. And so I look back on it now and myself and the others that were in this ward with me, when we would have those sessions of this concoction, this liquid being put through our systems, I, I can look back on it now and see the direct link to just an insane amount of anxiety. When, that, when, when those ingredients hit our systems and no one ever saw this, no one ever made this connection that this is not good for someone who's already dealing with anxiety, depression, fear over food, fear over weight gain, but this is their protocol. This is the only thing that they have in their back pocket. And still today, I mean, this was 38, 39 years ago, and this is still going on now. I um, sometimes visit uh, geographically people that have reached out to me that if there's a hospital close to me and they have a loved one or a son or a daughter in an ward and I'll go visit. I firsthand seen the same liquid being put through the NG feeding tube. So nothing has changed. And when you get to the point where you don't need the feeding tube or you have agreed to try to eat, then the feeding tube is removed and you're served in a, in a group setting with the other residents, the other clients, the other patients, a tray full of food that they expect you to eat fully. And most of it is ultra processed carbs. Most of it is cakes and cookies and pancakes and muffins. And depending on the philosophy of your hospital and the leaders over that hospital, they're sometimes may not be any animal protein at all. The, the hospitals that I specifically dealt with were backed by or run by the Seventh-day Adventists. And there is a history there of pushing a plant-based diet. And so all of the surrounding information that I got, whether it be through the psychiatrist, the cafeteria, um, behavioral therapists, clinical nutritionists, and dietitians while I was in the hospital, it, no, no one ever said, do, do you know it's important for your brain to eat protein and fat? Their philosophy, their, their base <laughs> protocol was never going to encourage that. They were all about um, carbs and um, ultra-processed foods and Proving that you could be released and go home and be proclaimed well by putting on weight and proving that you could eat these foods. They would pronounce you anorexia free. <laughs> and um, in my experience and, and others that I've talked to, this never happens. You, you come out with more weight on your frame. But the mental illness component of it is never ever lowered, it is never helped. So within a few hours of being released to go home, I'm already a mess. I'm already um, planning how I'm going to get out of 
family meals again, how I'm going to start high school at the end of summer and do pick up right where I left off, skip breakfast and lunch and, and figure out what to do about supper. This went along for quite a while. I tried to go to college, hoping that I could somehow try to be better. Uh, different atmosphere, different people, different environment. But the only arsenal that I had, you know, in, in my thoughts, the only thing I had to go on was that being better meant just eating more of what I would allow myself to eat. So if it was rice cakes, well then eat more rice cakes. If I could allow myself to eat oatmeal or a baked potato, then just eat more of that. And of course that never worked. I would put on a few pounds, but it was so awful to experience putting on those pounds because nothing had changed mentally. You can't effortlessly put on, choose to put on weight if the mental illness has not been healed. So I've been weight restored several times in that 40 year span and my mental illnesses always got worse because it was always through carbs and sugar. College didn't go well. <laughs> I got worse, of course. The stress of trying to be perfect to please my professors to maintain a 4.0 average, you know, something has to give, something has to suffer. And so um, while trying to be perfect academically, my physical and mental health suffered more. I dropped more weight. And at two years into college, I made the decision that I was going to lose my life. I was not going to survive. My dorm, at the end of those two weeks, were finding me in the restroom that was shared by the whole dorm, blacked out on the floor. Thankfully, I had not hit my head. I had not, you know, caused anything physically that would have taken me out immediately but that was that was rough and um i was also getting messages and counseling from the university medical clinic who knew of my condition from i wouldn't call them complaints but from professors and fellow students that were concerned about me and so i would be called in to the clinic and and counseled and and of course I was under traditional treatment this whole time. My parents would come pick me up at college and take me to my psychiatrist an hour away. I was under treatment. I was on meds. I was on psych meds, under treatment, seeing psychiatrists, um, still going back and forth once in a while with the dietitian that um, counseled me in the hospital, gave me the the meal plan, which of course. I couldn't follow. And when I did follow it, I got worse. So I dropped out of college and went home and tried to hold down a part-time job. But at that point, at around 90, 95 pounds, um, I, I, could, I couldn't do very much. I described my brain like it was cotton between my ears. The brain fog was debilitating. So to hold down a job, was almost impossible. And I was so thin and I was so cold all of the time that it was difficult to be warm. I had no energy. I spent a lot of time resting in between psychiatric appointments. So that didn't really go very well either, but I, I did the best that I could to get through that time. Um, around the time I was 22, I met who was going to be my future husband. And um, we began dating. We met at church. He knew most of my sickness. He didn't know to the extent 
of what I was dealing with, but just by looking at me, I mean, he obviously knew I had anorexia. He didn't know about everything else. He didn't know that I'd been diagnosed with schizoaffective. He didn't know the extent of the anxiety and panic attacks and the clinical depression. And he didn't know about the the OCD that had morphed into cutting and trichotillomania. So um, I was self-punishing by cutting my arms and legs and pulling out scalp hair and eyelashes and eyebrows. Um, that in itself is difficult to explain to someone who's never studied it or never experienced it because it is it's a very insane activity. It's very difficult to explain why, can, why can't you just stop doing that activity. The reason you can't is because it's a neurological disorder. You can promise yourself that you're going to stop, but the disorder wins out every time. Mental illness wins out every time because it's not something that you can just stop until your brain is healed, actually healed through metabolic therapy and through getting the over 100 neurotransmitters that your brain holds to a optimal level through nutrition. And that's when all of this can go away and you can walk away and never do it again. But he didn't know the extent of all of that. So we dated for a year and a half. And within that time, his unconditional love was something I'd never experienced before. Um, but from a man, I should say, you know, I knew my mom loved me. I knew my, my grandma loved me. Um, I had you know, some issues with my grandfather and my uncle who were a little harsh and just would say, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and just eat a hamburger. Um, you know, they weren't willing to understand what this actually was. And of course, my estranged relationship with my dad didn't help any. So he was the first one to accept me, all of me for, for who I was and, and love me anyway. Um, dating was, was difficult because of what I could eat and what I couldn't eat. But um, his love allowed me to get to the very first time that I would consider myself to be weight restored. And nothing was better mentally, of course, but I was at a, at a healthier weight. And at that point, I was able to hold down a full-time job. And we got engaged and got married. And um, I was still under treatment, still trying um, different combinations of SSRIs and um, actual psych meds that were supposed to help with the voices, like Seroquel or an, um, Neurontin to change the chemistry in my brain, um, different SSRIs, you know, um, old ones like Elevil and Amitriptyline. They tried some old ones to see if they would help me. And then, of course, would try the new ones of Prozac and Paxil. Fexer and uh, Wellbutrin and all these different ones, Zoloft, um, even trying to change brain chemistry with, with Valium and Xanax, used in different combinations, sometimes taking me off some, sometimes adding some over the course of, of 30 years. And of course, never helped. It, they just caused side effects. I felt flat. I felt numb and sedated. And it never helped any of my psychiatric symptoms. I did not have or experience a reduction in the voices, depression, anxiety, um, any relief from the OCD, and definitely no relief from the anorexia behaviors. So we were uh, young, married, and uh, making our life together. And I actually got to a weight that um, 
my 15 year absence of my menstrual period resumed. And um, that was something kind of a miracle because when this started at 14, I had halted puberty completely. I had only uh, had a menstrual period for a year and then it was halted completely. And then I did not have another period for 15. So that was, that was pretty big. And um, we wanted to see if I could um, get pregnant and have a child. And doctors told me, don't count on it. You've, you know, you've halted everything and everything was just not optimal. I had some testing done and they couldn't even tell me whether I was even ovulating or not. But um, as a miracle, <laughs> I did get pregnant. The pregnancy was extremely difficult. Gaining weight that I needed to, putting my daughter and the pregnancy ahead of mental illness took just about every ounce of strength that I had. And mentally, everything grew worse. Since I wasn't actively engaging in starving, then the other mental illness features grew worse. The cutting and the hair pulling grew much, much worse. The depression grew worse. The anxiety and the panic attacks grew worse. Thankfully, she was born healthy. I went through some very severe postpartum depression, very severe. Um, and I think the schizo effective voices, I don't think, I know, that made it much, much worse because those voices were literally telling me every day to harm my daughter. It was difficult. After she was born and um, I succumbed again to starving, I, I, I couldn't not do it. I just couldn't cope, I just couldn't stay the way I was. And so everything just continued to spiral down. As my daughter grew, I became worse. And my family was tormented over this. They suffered a lot. Anyone who has mental illness in their family, there's so much suffering that goes on with the loved ones. It's just horrendous because they're standing by helplessly. There's nothing that they can do because even advocating for inpatient doesn't doesn't fix anything. At this point, I, you know, I was 20 or 30 years into malnutrition and, a, and just another decade of a further descent into madness. And physically, physical complications, medical complications began to happen. You can't go that many years that skeletal at this point, diving wholeheartedly back into this um, between the ages of 40 and 48, I had um, stayed at less than 80 pounds, sometimes all the way down to 75. And there were a lot of things that went wrong. I um, not only had very, very low blood pressure and very, very low cholesterol, um, which of course we know <laughs> is needed by our brain to work properly. Um, I had a lot of diagnoses that happened physically. So 
I had iron deficient anemia. I had um, very bad hypothyroidism. I had chronic bone pain and diagnosed very severe osteoporosis. And because of some of these things that were going on physically, there were complications. The osteoporosis and the OCD that drove me to excessively exercise, those two combinations, and of course the malnutrition of no protein or fat for almost 40 years, was just a firestorm for fractures. So within a five-year period, I had had five fractures, both my arms and my legs. And they were not a trauma injury. I had not fallen from a story up. I had not been in a car accident. Um, it, was, it was losing my balance and, and toppling to the ground on carpet. And I broke my wrist. It was um, out power walking. But because of the overexercise and the malnutrition and the health of my bones, just walking. I fractured my knee and, and, and then the next year I fractured my femur and my tibia. And the recovery for these were horrendous also. Most people, when they fracture a bone, it, it's, you know, four weeks, six weeks, no weight bearing exercise, you know, eat lots of good food and it, it heals. And for me, I was bed bound for months at a time. And if I tried to put any kind of weight on, if it was my wrist or my arm or my leg, try to put any kind of weight bearing, I was right back in a spiral of pain again. And I had to go, okay, another few more weeks. I would go see the orthopedist and, and you know, it had been so many weeks and they would evaluate how I was doing and that I was not healing the way that I should. And they would just tell me, it's, you know, you're going to have to go to no weight bearing again, go back on crutches, go back to being down and bed rest for several more weeks and we'll reevaluate and try again. So those were difficult, very difficult. And I also had surgeries that happened. Because of the malnutrition, My, my blood vessels and arteries weren't well. And so um, I had complications with my throat at one point and I had four emergency surgeries in six days for complications of when I had my tonsils removed. The, I, I did the exact protocol they wanted me to do post-surgery to the letter. But it wasn't enough, obviously. And so when I resumed light activity after that four-week period was over, um, I ruptured an artery in my throat. And the only way that they can explain it to me as it continued to rupture after they repaired it and sent me home, it happened four nights in a row, was that there was just nothing that they could suture this to and cauterize it enough because of the, of the malnutrition. And <laughs> I'm actually in, in that ear, nose and throat surgeon's um, medical journal somewhere because he had been a surgeon for 30 years and had never experienced this in his life. So he wrote a paper about it and put it in a medical journal. Um, not, not the way you want to be remembered. <laughs> so um, that was that one. That, those were the kinds of medical things that would happen to me that were in that, you know, half a percent of ever happening to anyone. And the one that was the most devastating surgically was in 2010. At this point, I was 40. And again, I was less than 80 pounds. I began to have a lot of pelvic pain. And 
I went to several doctors to diagnose this. And what happened was that I, I not only had lost all my skeletal muscle externally, I had lost skeletal everything. You know, there was no muscle left externally. Well, when there's none left externally for your body to use and replenish, um, it starts attacking organs and internal musculature. And so I had also lost all of that. So this pelvic pain that I was feeling turned out to be diagnosed as multi-organ prolapse. And my, um, my colon, my uterus, and my bladder all prolapsed internally. And then when I would stand up, they prolapsed externally, which made um, any kind of bathroom activities almost impossible. So I was headed for surgery. And even though it should have been an emergency surgery, it had to be scheduled out because they needed three specialists to coordinate in the operating room itself to come in and each do their part to repair or remove or resection each of those. So I needed uh, a gastroenterologist, I needed a, um, a bladder specialist, um, a urology specialist, and I needed a, a gynecological surgeon for um, the uterus part. So I had to um, endure that surgery, which was very difficult. I'm allergic to all opiates, and so there was no pain relief. Um, and it also made um, anesthesia difficult because part of the component of putting someone to sleep is also using piggybacking off of that an opiate for pain relief. And at one point during the surgery, um, because they couldn't use the opiates, I woke up during surgery and I still have nightmares about that. That, uh, that was uh, devastating. So what needed to be done was they needed to remove my uterus that it could not be saved. And my bladder had to be repositioned and put back where it needed to be. And since there was nothing they could attach it to, because I had no internal muscle, it had to be um, put back in place with mesh. And um, my colon, it was so badly damaged from starvation and from years and years and bottles of harsh laxative abuse, that they had to remove and resection 18 inches and reattach. And again, since there was no internal muscle, they had to attach it internally to my tailbone to keep it from falling again. That recovery was horrendous. It was supposed to take me six to eight weeks to feel fairly normal internally and externally with the horizontal abdominal um, way that they needed to repair all of this from the front. And it took me a year to recover from that. And of course, in that time, um, I was not feeding myself in order to recover. I was at that point eating cans of diet soup that had 50 calories in the entire can. So basically it was chicken broth with a little bit of cooked celery in it that you could buy over the counter at the grocery store. That's what I was eating to try to stay warm and to try to manipulate I guess my family to say, here, look, I'm eating, look, I'm eating cans of soup. But of course it wasn't anything that was going to heal me, anything that was going to add to any sort of nutrition. Once I finally healed from that surgery and, and got back to quote unquote, somewhat normal life for us, which was not normal. I knew that I wasn't going to 
survive another year. I knew by the time it got to be 2015, 2016, I was 45 years old and I had weaned myself, titrated myself off of the psych meds because I was functioning worse on them than I was off of them. I no longer had a psychiatrist because the last three had basically fired me and told me not to come back because they considered me to be treatment resistant and basically told me to just accept this, that this was permanent, that there was nothing more for me. There was nothing more that they could do. So I was kind of just left to my own devices. And I felt very hopeless and very helpless. And at that point, I was praying to not wake up anymore. And my physical condition was so bad that my daughter tells me now, as an adult, I didn't know it then, that she would lay in bed and cry, worried that when she woke up in the morning that I would no longer be living. And my husband was distraught over the same thing. He would come to me. He's a very strong, masculine man, but with a tender heart. And he would come to me with tears streaming down his face, begging me to eat something because he feared that I would go into cardiac arrest. I knew that weight restoration was not going to be the answer. It's just not with carbs. I began to research the brain. I began to research what, what makes your brain work for normal people? Those who don't have mental illness, what, what is it in, in brain neurotransmitters that makes them work properly? Found a couple of books at our local library by Julia Ross called The Mood Cure and The Diet Cure. And that was the first time that I had ever read or it been presented to me that what I eat could affect my brain. I, of course, all through school and through high school and with nutrition classes, I mean, we talked about protein. We talked about protein for, for muscle building, but no one ever talked about what it does for the brain. Cholesterol, amino acids from nutrient-dense animal foods, the brain neurotransmitters, what all of this has to do to work together for your brain to work properly. So at that point, armed with a little bit of knowledge from these couple of books, that was when, um, even though we lived in uh, rural Ohio, that was when we got our first smart TV and we got internet for the first time and I was introduced to YouTube. And so I was curious to find out if there was anything on YouTube, anyone having videos or anyone you know, back then, the big thing was, was watching a TED talk. So I found Dr. Georgia Ede and Dr. Chris Palmer. And they were backing up these same discoveries that I'd made in these two books. They were talking about the importance of animal foods, those building blocks of amino acids that are needed. That's the only thing that makes our brain neurotransmitters. And if those are missing, all kinds of problems will result. And of course, in my case, I had I had six mental illness DSM categories on my chart to prove that. I began to wonder, I was skeptical. It certainly, you know, it, it, if I embarked on this, it certainly wasn't going to be easy, but could it be this simple? Could it be that putting the very food back in that I had not eaten for 35 years could it help me? 
could it make some sort of difference in my brain and my thoughts and how I felt. I was very skeptical, but it, there was, a, there was a, a spark there. There was a light bulb moment there because, because I had not eaten those foods for that many years. If I had been, um, there are some anorexics who, who limit their calories to very low, but they're still eating a bite of chicken here or there, or they're still eating, you know, a hamburger here or there, as long as it fits within their calorie limit for the day. And in that sense, someone could probably say, well, that's, you know, that's crazy to think that eating meat would help your brain, uh, you know, if someone is still eating a little bit of meat. So that was why it was my glimmer of hope. I literally had not been eating any animal products for decades. So there, that was, that was the spark. <laughs> the next task in implementing this was the hardest thing that I ever had to do. I had to do it my way or it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to be sustainable because I would, I would relapse and spiral very, very quickly. I was not going to be someone who could trade whole plates of food for whole plates of meat, you know, from this, from the standard American diet and, and just, you know, cut out carbs and sugar and certain vegetables and just eat plates of meat. I wasn't eating whole plates of food. And I also wasn't going to be someone who could say, okay, I'm going to go on this high fat ketogenic metabolic therapy nutrition protocol and I'm going to eat fat bombs or or tablespoons of tallow to feed my brain. I had been fat free. I mean no oil, no margarine, nothing. That was one of the reasons we stopped going out to eat because I literally would argue with the server and the kitchen staff that, that there was oil on my steamed broccoli. I I literally could not consume that. It would put me into a panic attack and a spiral that would just be horrible because if I suspected it, that it was on there or I ate a bite of it and it, I knew it was on there, the next day I would not eat anything to compensate for that bite of whatever was had butter on it or oil on it. So I had to figure out a way that this was going to work for me. So I, I know the term for it now. It's basically a reverse diet technique. But then, you know, back then, I, I didn't have a term for it. I didn't have a blueprint for it. I didn't have anyone guiding me. I was doing this on my own. I was doing this in uncharted waters, uncharted territory. But I am an organized person. And so in order for me to accomplish this, I felt like the most bland and benign meat that I could try was going to be chicken breast. And so that's where I started. I promised myself and told myself, and I went over this with my husband. He knew everything that I knew up to this point of what I was reading and what I was watching and this plan that I was going to embark on. So that first night I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I have one ounce of fat-free chicken breast, two tablespoons, hardest thing I ever had to try to chew and swallow. I cried for hours. The voices screamed louder. The drive to starve, was overwhelming but i did it and i promised myself that i would do this every day hoping that in a week or 10 days it would become a little easier 
And then I promised myself that I would double it. I would go from one ounces to two and from two to three and from three to four and so on and so forth. And thankfully, it, it went along those lines. Sometimes it was a week, sometimes it was longer, especially when I got up in the higher amount of ounces. When I got to the eight ounce point, a couple of months in, about three months in, that was when I found Dr. Sean Baker and Dr. Ken Berry and Dr. Anthony Chafee. And I began to binge watch their videos. And of course, they are always talking about the nutrition benefits and profiles of beef. And so I decided that that's what I was going to do next. So I did what I could, and um, it was 96% fat free ground beef. I traded equal amounts, the eight ounces of chicken for the ground beef. And mind you, uh, all, all the rest of what was in my day was still that cup of spinach and a cup of celery. That's all I was eating when I embarked on this. So that was still in there with the now eight ounces of ground beef. But that's all that was in there because that's all I was previously eating for several years. When I got to the six month mark and I had made it up to about 10 to 12 ounces of that ground beef, I knew that I needed to try to get into ketosis and that meant I needed more fat. And at that point, some of my mental illness features were starting to lower a little. I had a little bit less anxiety, a little bit less depression. The voices that were screaming now felt like they were in another room with the door closed instead of right in my face. Nothing had changed with the anorexia features, except that I was looking forward to and I was enjoying that ground beef. I still couldn't add fat or, or tallow or anything like that. So I began to make chuck roasts in the crock pot in the slow cooker, and that provided me with a transition from the 10 or 12 ounces of ground beef to now switch over to chuck roast, which gave me a higher fat profile, but it was within the meat and it was something that I could do. So I did that for another three months, got me to the nine month mark. In that six to nine month mark, my brain no longer felt like cotton between my ears. The brain fog was lifting. And it was at this point that I started to learn about the anti-nutrients in plants and about oxalate toxins. And I had listened to some talks and I had matched up some of my illnesses that I had suffered with that I was told by gynecologists were permanent. They were presenting it in a way that were cluing me in that the plant foods that I was over consuming for years could actually be causing what I was experiencing. So I removed the spinach and the celery to see if any of the illnesses that I suspected were from oxalates would get any better. I was suffering. Um, from a condition called vulvodynia and interstitial cystitis. And it felt like knife daggers, shards of glass within my pelvic area. And doctors diagnosed this as those two diagnoses, but there was no help for it. There was no cure for it. They told me that I would have it for the rest of my life, just like my IBS. 
I was also suffering from um, still the hypothyroid, still the osteoporosis. I had ring, um, bad ringing in my ears. I had tinnitus. And the research that I was doing was starting to align some of these illnesses with oxalate toxins. And so at the six to nine month mark, um, I didn't know the term for it then. Back then, there was no lion diet. There wasn't talked about, but that's what I did. I went off of the remaining vegetables and, and stuck with the beef, salt, and water, stuck with the chuck roast. At this point, I was enough better that I no longer was adding an ounce each week. I began to be able, for the first time in my life, eat until I was full and then uh, walk away until I was hungry again, which was big for me. I had ignored those signals for many years. I had ignored the stomach growling, the, the ghrelin hormone that, that is responsible for hunger. I had ignored it for so many years, it, it had stopped. I mean, you get to that level of starvation, your body no longer signals for you to feed it because you, it knows that it, you're not going to. So I had not experienced hunger or satiety for many, many years. I didn't even know if I could even learn that anymore. I, I figured for the rest of my life, I would have to count calories and have to say this is my meal and this is enough food for me and and just do that every day that it was going to be a regimented plan and I was never going to be able to listen to the signals in my body and have freedom but those things were were happening and between the 9 and 12 month mark I was getting relief from the oxalate toxins no longer entering my system. And I was experiencing relief from those physical symptoms that I had never experienced before since I had been diagnosed with these painful illnesses. And so that was proving to be true. And when I finally got to that, that 12 month mark, I was at um, about a pound of red meat and everything left, everything, everything healed. For the first time that I can remember back into my childhood, my, my brain was calm. There was no voice. It wasn't lowered. It wasn't once in a while. It wasn't wake up the next day and it's back. It was completely gone. Completely gone. The cutting and hair pulling, I walked away from. I, I, it was not a decision that I made that I'm never going to do this again. This was a brain healing that I could look at that activity and say, that's a horrible thing to do to yourself. And I never, ever want to do that to myself ever again. It has no hold on me. I have complete freedom. The OCD is gone. I have no panic attacks. I have no anxiety. I definitely have no depression. I live every day in overflowing joy. Everybody has bad days. Everybody has stress. Everybody has things going on in their lives that will dampen your emotional health. And, and I, you know, I have that also. There's things that go wrong. There's you know, cars that break down. There's water, you know, water lines that leak. There's faucets that break. But nothing, nothing can bring me down. It's like I'm floating above it. I, I'm able to deal with those things without spiraling down 
into a bad mood that I can't get back out of. This just kind of allows me to float above that and I'm able to deal with those external things going wrong while maintaining the joy is still there. The anorexia. It is so completely gone. It is so, <laughs> so amazing. I will never relapse. There is, there is no way that I will re ever relapse. That first year of my healing, when all of my mental illness healings occurred, when my brain neurotransmitters healed from the overabundance of eating in abundance every day, every day, every day of all of that red meat, I had not gained a pound at the one year mark. So weight restoration in itself does not heal anorexia. Weight restoration came after years two through four. I was rebuilding my body with a vengeance. <laughs> I wanted to be strong. I wanted to have shape. I wanted to be so vibrant that no one had to do things for me anymore. Those years that I was sick and so skeletal, I, I couldn't even put firewood in the fireplace. I couldn't carry laundry. I couldn't do normal things that a strong woman should be able to do to be an equal partner in her marriage and in her family, to provide for her family. So I worked hard to reverse and figure out a protocol to heal my thyroid, to heal my osteoporosis. I didn't want to ever, ever have another fracture. That was when I um, did a deep dive into what does the thyroid need? What do your bones need? People don't talk about underactive thyroid needing protein. People don't talk about that your bones are 50% protein. You cannot heal either one of those if you are not eating protein in abundance. So the second through fourth year, armed with more knowledge and ready to tackle this <laughs> and try to see if I could reverse some of these issues that could make the rest of my, the second half of my life, my middle age life, could make them, could make it or break it. You know, I, I didn't want to be 60 or 70 and, and keep enduring fractures. I didn't want to make it to that age being mental illness free, but my thyroid completely destroyed. And, and look at more medications. I wanted to see how far I could, I could take this. So the healing of the anorexia part, all of those features, the, I'm no longer triggered. I can talk about and experience fasting that before would make me spiral to seeing how many days I could go without eating, it would be a trigger. I now coach clients and run their macros for them and it doesn't affect me. I used to be able to look at calorie counts and it would trigger me. It, it would cause me to have a downward spiral back into bad behaviors because the mental illness had not been healed. I had terrible body dysmorphia where I looked in the mirror and saw someone very obese. That's a neurological complication also. And that completely healed. Um, every single anorexia feature that, that you can talk about of, of a line of symptoms are completely gone. Life is, life is wonderful. Life is good. And I knew that I wanted to start to speak. I never knew where it would take me. 
I never knew that I would have the honor and the privilege to actually be speaking on it for someone to hear me. It started with a tweet on Twitter from Dr. Sean Baker, and he put the question out there a while ago before I had, I had my account on Twitter, but I had never posted anything and I was not on any other social media. He put the question out there that what do you think about carnivore diet? Do you think what we eat impacts mental health? And reading through those replies, there was, there was my answer of my prayer of when to get involved. My prayer had been when. T tell me when it's time to get involved. Tell me when it's time to start speaking about this. That was it because there were a lot of replies on his post that said, that's ludicrous. That's ridiculous. Mental illness has nothing to do with food, has nothing to do with nutrition. It has nothing to do with healing your brain. That was when I, I put out my very first post and listed what I had healed from. And it wasn't very long after that that I was contacted by Nick Norowitz to ask me if I would be willing to provide the documentation and willing to do the work to be in his case series, his anorexia carnivore animal based case series that he wanted to enter into the Journal of Metabolic Health. And I was overjoyed. I was overjoyed to be able to participate in that. So I worked with him um, for several months, providing documentation, being interviewed, uh, those sorts of things. And um, when that came out and was aired on, on Twitter and Instagram, um, that was when I revealed myself because when you're in a case series, it has to be anonymous until it's entered. And I knew waiting for it to be entered, I knew that I was going to reveal myself, that I didn't want to be anonymous. I wanted in my heart of hearts that if someone had read this case series and was suffering, I didn't want them to read it and think that's nice, but it could never happen to me. I wanted to put a face and a name behind patient number three. I wanted to be able to connect with people and tell them that this is real, that this healing is real. And that's what I do every day. <laughs> so <laughs> that is such an inspiring story and and thank you for you know sharing this with us and, and not just us, right? I mean you, you've been on quite a number of other podcasts and evangelizing your story and telling everybody about you know the benefits of the carnivore diet and the various lifestyle changes that you've made. I don't know exactly, you know, who's going to be listening to this podcast, but I got to imagine that there's somebody out there that maybe has mental illness themselves that's listening. What would be your advice, you know, obviously coming from somebody who went through it yourself? What's what is your advice to somebody who has mental illness um, when it comes to addressing it? I would say someone watching has to be dealing with some sort of degree because we are now at 25%, one in four will experience depression or anxiety enough for it, for it to be diagnosed. So we're living in a mental illness and a mental health crisis. It is rising astronomically the last few decades. My message would be, even though you feel helpless and hopeless, that no one is beyond hope. No one is too far gone. I don't care how many decades you've suffered 
whether it's five years or 40 years like me. No one is too far gone. No one is beyond hope. I advocate for arming yourself with as much knowledge as possible so that you can go into this confident, whether it be a straight high fat ketogenic diet that still involves low carb vegetables, which I am completely on board with. You know, there's variations to this diet. It just depends on what your illnesses are. I always advise people to go as strict as your illnesses dictate. Not everyone needs a lion diet. Not everyone needs carnivore. Not everyone needs, you know, ketivore. You have to evaluate what your current illnesses are and start somewhere. Many people transition. They will start a ketogenic diet and will experience improvements and will gain full healing within that. Just going no sugar, no grains, um, you know, low oxalate, low anti-nutrient vegetables, and a lot of animal protein and a lot of fat, they'll achieve complete remission of what they're dealing with. But there are some of us that need to go further. And I tell others, start from where you are. Read all that you can. If it's mental health, I encourage them to get Dr. Georgia E's brand new book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. What's in her book is a culmination of 10 years of research. The same knowledge that she talked about in her talks that I found six and seven years ago. The same with Dr. Chris Palmer get his book Brain Energy, to start to understand the connection between nutrition and brain neurotransmitters. When you start to understand the absolute importance of how our brains function and what our brains need to function, that is gonna arm you with the knowledge that you need to implement a change in your food that will give you the motivation that will eventually change your life. But start from where you are, read all that you can to, to gain that foundation of knowledge, to know that healing is possible and that you're on the right track. You know, it's so interesting because uh... One of the major criticisms of the carnivore diet that I see floating around Twitter is that uh, restricting yourself to just meat is going to give you an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. But from listening to, you know, your story, it sounds like, you know, the the calorie counting itself is more contributing to eating disorders than, you know, restricting the types of food that you eat. W would you say that's the case? I totally, totally agree. If you're coming at it from an incessant number ticking, you know, that you're going to count calories and, and then to lose weight to lower those calories and, and that can put you in the headspace of being obsessive and restrictive. <clears throat> this, the carnivore diet for mental illness is not restrictive in the sense that it's going it's it's going to heal your brain this is coming from the standpoint of using it as a as a therapy this is this was my medical intervention this was what it was going to take for me to eventually gain my freedom now i can choose to eat whatever I want to, I have complete freedom. If I wanted to go eat a piece of cake, I can. If I wanted to go eat, you know, pancakes or a bagel or a baked potato, I have the freedom to do that. But I choose to eat the foods that make me feel 
the vibrancy that of the thriving life that I have found and I want to keep. I don't have obsessive thoughts over food anymore. You would think, um, quote unquote, restricting to just meat, that that would drive up obsessive thoughts about other foods higher. But it actually is the opposite. I am so satiated on the volume of food that I eat every day that nothing else even sounds good. I can get done with a 24 ounce steak and um, you know, a rolling cart goes by that, ha that has desserts on it that other people you know, at the table are, are picking out. It doesn't even look like something that I want to eat anymore. So it, it's in terms of brain healing, it's not restrictive. It is what healed our brain. So it, I don't view it as restriction. Um, it has given me my freedom because if you want to talk about restriction, being in bed with fractures, that's restricting. Being in a hospital bed, having organs removed, that's restricting. Um, not being able to go out to eat because my mental illnesses won't allow me to eat anything but a bowl of plain lettuce, that's restricting. That's living a restrictive lifestyle where I cannot function. Restriction to me is not being able to live my life in freedom. Going back to that would cause me to have restriction. So eating this way is my freedom. It's not restriction to me. Yeah, I think it's um, it's very disingenuous to characterize the carnivore diet in that way when you were in the hospital with an NG tube and your diet was severely restricted to very specific um, food groups, if you will. Yeah. Um, I also found your story about your hospital being run by the Seventh Day Adventists to be extremely interesting because I'm uh, reading about them and just uh, Kellogg of Kellogg cereal was a Seventh Day Adventist and this there's John a lot Kellogg. Of, yeah. <laughs> A lot of um, interesting incentives kind of between the cereal uh, yes. carb industry and how um, people are treated in hospitals with respect to their nutrition. So I thought that was um, interesting uh, that you brought that up as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've done a deep dive, you know, into the Kellogg brothers, into um, the, the leaders of the Seventh Day at Church and Ellen G. White and her her visions from God that told us that we should only eat plants and how that how those people on her church board became the founding members of a lot of our three lettered experts, you know, the CDC, the AHA, the ADA. Um, and that's where all of this came from. That's where all of this plant based push came from. Yeah. One of the comments that I also read uh, a lot on Twitter and, and other places about the carnivore diet um, is that uh, you know it's it's not it's not a good diet because meat is good for you. It's it only works because you're eliminating bad stuff that doesn't agree with your system. How much of your health journey do you think is attributable to getting the good stuff in meat? versus eliminating the bad stuff that didn't agree with your body? That's a very good question. And using me as an example, if fruits and vegetables, if whole plant foods were going to heal me for 40 years, they would have. Because I had complete decades where I was not in a hospital-like setting, where I was not eating ultra-processed foods. I was not eating what is considered let's take this out and it wasn't the meat that healed you it was taking out the bad stuff i wasn't eating that that's all i was eating was fruits and vegetables and and sometimes in there maybe a whole grain like quinoa or a whole grain like oatmeal or a baked potato 
So I was not consuming anything that I would consider that needed to be removed in order for me to heal. For me, it was the meat. It was the protein. It was the whole nutrient dense amino acids to heal my brain. It wasn't removing the other things. It was, it was the animal foods being put in. But, but you did mention removing the spinach and the celery. I did, but I did you, but, did you, yeah. did you see an effect from that? Yes. Yes. The, the issues that I had that were from oxalate toxins, um, healed. And so um, the bladder issues that I was having, the interstitial cystitis that ended up being oxalate crystals that were um, circulating in my system. And for me, that's where they settled. For me, it wasn't a kidney stone. For me, it was in the female area where it was affecting me. So yes, it, removing those high oxalate vegetables did heal physical issues for me but you know i wasn't eating cakes and cookies and <laughs> and donuts <laughs> that's not what that's not what i removed in order to feel better you you've also um just you know listening to your story we're talking about decades of kind of being run through the medical system uh various different pills, different combinations of pills, surgeries. Um, you know, when I think about the current state of the medical system, that's really what I think about, pills and surgery. Um, that's what they know how to do, right? What are your thoughts on the medical system writ large? And, you know, if you were to be given all the power in the world to change that, like what how would you architect a medical system that really, really works uh, for, for patient needs? Currently with the way mainstream medical system is now, I, I will use them for trauma. If I have something that I cannot fix myself, car accident, <laughs> a bone breaking, um, an infection that, that I need medicine for that I can't mitigate myself, I have not been back to a doctor in five years, and I don't really intend to do that until and unless I experience something where I need someone. In a perfect world, what I would construct is what Dr. Sean Baker has launched with Rivero Health. He has launched this, and he has a team of clinicians that is going to revolutionize anyone who goes to him as a patient. He is presenting this from the standpoint of using nutrition first. And that's the way that I think it should be in a perfect world. It, it, you should go to your doctor just like someone who takes their animal to their veterinarian. And if they have a skin condition, that veterinarian, the first thing they ask is, what are you feeding it? We don't go to our own mainstream doctors and they ask us that question. They don't ask us what we're eating. They just order tests, do blood work, and dispense pills. So in a perfect world, I would, I would look at the whole person. I would look at nutrition first. I would look at um, blood markers that would point to deficiencies, especially if you have been ill for decades that need to be addressed because I'm not opposed to supplements. I used some myself because I was so deficient in so many things that it would have taken me even longer to heal than a year if I had not helped my system with the same components that are in meat with some isolating supplements that was gonna give my system a kickstart. So I'm you know, not opposed to those at all. Um, but I don't, want, I don't want medicalization to be the way it is now, that, that there is no cause for what you're dealing with, that there is no root cause healing, 
that there's only pills to mitigate the symptoms. That is no way to live. And that is no way to get back to thriving health. Yeah, let's let's talk about supplements for a little bit because um, I'm sure there's a number of people listening that would be interested in you know what supplements um, you know you added to kind of the portfolio of uh, of, of your healing journey. Um, what supplements did you take that were effective, and how did you know, or how did you kind of come to the realization that those supplements would be helpful for you? Okay, in terms of the brain. Those first two books that I read by Julia Ross, The Mood Cure and The Diet Cure, she goes into detail about some of the main neurotransmitters, dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine, different um, nutrients and different brain neurotransmitters and what they are responsible for and what they do for you and what your symptoms are if you are deficient. So when I started this, um, knowing that I wasn't going to be able to sit down to a steak every day, <laughs> I used the, some of the knowledge from those books to order some supplements and, and do a lot of research on what brand names, what milligram level. So at the beginning, um, and I also did a deep dive into magnesium. Um, more than 80% of people are deficient in magnesium. And there are a lot of illnesses that people experience on a lot of different spectrums that can be helped and or healed by magnesium. We don't have that in our water and our soil anymore. And along, go along with that, the unrefined mineral salt that we need also that has electrolytes and trace minerals. That was another thing that I had to tackle because I was also salt free for 40 years. I was so deficient in, in minerals, which of course is another component in your thyroid, in, um, in your bone health, in your brain health. Um, your brain needs salt, your brain needs minerals. So in terms of the brain, I took um, a supplement called GABA relaxer. And it not only has GABA in it, it also has um, inositol and glycine in it, which are very good for relaxation, for your brain, for sleep. If you don't get good sleep, you're not going to have restoration. Um, you know, sleep is restorative. Along with that, I found um, through those books, the precursor to serotonin is a nutrient called 5-HTP. And so I, with, with the knowledge from that book, she was able to um, make me understand that not any 5-HTP supplement was going to do what I wanted it to do because it can also irritate the stomach. So I found what she had advised, a double enteric coated one that does not open and does not release until it gets to the colon, which is where you want it to release because serotonin is made in the gut. It's made in the small and large intestine. It's not made in the stomach. And that's why it's irritating if, if those capsules or those tablets disintegrate in the stomach. So I found you know, that particular one. For anxiety, I found um, the supplement L-theanine, it is very, very good for anxiety, panic attacks, features of PTSD. It's very deficient in people that have high cortisol levels, adrenal fatigue. It gets used up first and it needs to be, I feel, it needs to be supplemented back while you're doing a nutrition therapy so that your brain and your body is supported along with the animal foods that you're implementing. Vitamin D3 and K2 are also very important depending on where you live. I'm in Ohio. I prioritize sun April through October, but that is the extent of, of the sun that, that I get. 
and your vitamin D level is very telling in terms of depression, in terms of um, prevention of future heart issues or stroke issues, that level needs to be high. It needs to be greater than 50 in your blood markers and even higher if you have uh, diagnosed cardiac issues. So those are the ones that I used plus magnesium. Um, magnesium glycinate and threonate are the top two that I have found are the most bioavailable and the most absorbent. Three and eight is fairly new. It's the only one that crosses the blood brain barrier. And it's very, very good for cognitive issues, cognitive decline, mental issues, Alzheimer's, dementia, brain fog, um, those suffering with ADHD, some levels of autism. It's super, super important. I took both of those in smaller doses because part of what I needed in terms of magnesium, each one, there's 14 different forms of magnesium. Each one is a little bit need specific. So if you have a certain issue that it can grab, it can point you towards a certain type. Part of my issue because of the years of laxative abuse, I had stripped the muscles, the peristalsis wave in my colon. I could not go to the bathroom without assistance. And up until that point of my healing, I had been using Miralax, high doses every day. When you, do, when you overhaul what you're doing with your food, you begin to investigate everything that you're putting in your mouth, which is when I discovered that even though my doctors told me it was safe and effective, that this is ethylene glycol. This is, this is antifreeze. This is not good. This is putting a coating on my intestines and what food I was eating, I wasn't absorbing it or it was on top of that causing leaky gut. So my answer for that and also to fuel my magnesium was to use magnesium citrate. That allowed me to have a safe osmotic laxative that worked with my body and use the water that I was drinking to move food through my system for normal gut motility. I don't recommend that to everyone, only if they have a problem with constipation. Because <laughs> if you don't have a got problem with it, magnesium citrate is not going to be your friend. <laughs> so I use that also. And that is you know, part of the brain protocol. Um, magnesium is also important for osteoporosis and for thyroid. So those, those were the ones that I used for the brain. For thyroid, um, I began to read a lot about what is needed for that. Um, it needs high protein. It needs unrefined mineral salt. It needs minerals. Um, it needs a, a lot of nutrients. And I did not want to use um, thyroxine. I did not want to use Synthroid. For a time, I, I was on um, natural desiccated liver. So when I uh, figured out a protocol to try to turn around my hypothyroid, the, the product that I used specifically for that was, um, it was a now brand supplements and it's called thyroid energy. And um, it has everything in it that your thyroid needs to gently encourage your thyroid to make hormone along with um, high levels of animal foods that are going to help that also. Um, if another key component of your thyroid health is iodine. Living in Ohio, the Midwest states are known as the goiter belt. Our soil has even less iodine in it than the rest of the country that at least has the benefit of being on a coast and getting some iodine from the ocean and from the, you know, that direction. So I needed to look at iodine and that's one of the ingredients in that thyroid energy. If I was not someone who ate fish, I um, would definitely use Lugol's 2% iodine drops 
and many, many people use those to raise their iodine threshold in order to help their thyroid heal. I consume salmon and cod and other fish that have a higher iodine level. And I was, once my thyroid healed and I went off of some of those supplements, I watched for symptoms. I was ready to go on iodine drops if I noticed any hypothyroid symptoms returning. Um, thankfully, I didn't. I still recommend it for other people um, with their diagnosis of hypothyroid. It's super, super important. Um, Dr. Brownstein's groundbreaking book that's been, you know, in a fifth or sixth edition that he wrote 20 years ago on iodine and why we need it is, is a, an amazing resource to understand the process of, of why our whole body needs iodine. So that was part of what I did for thyroid. Um, osteoporosis. Um, I have a whole four port four part protocol on Twitter that I wrote because I had so many people and one weekend I had 50 people DM me and say, what, you know, how, how did you feel osteoporosis? That's not possible. I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> so I spent every weekend um, for several weeks writing out in detail exactly what I did in order to help other people. So I broke that up into, into segments. I had um, one about understanding how much protein is needed for osteoporosis. One post that is sun and supplements, how important it is for sun exposure and or vitamin D3, K2 and supplements and then weight training. Though, though you need all of those components. Yeah. You, you cannot heal osteoporosis by eating six ounces of meat a day and um, not getting your magnesium and your selenium and your boron, which are key components of bone. You cannot heal it if you are continuing to eat anti-nutrients in plant foods and in grain because it will leach the minerals out of your bone. And you can't heal it if you don't implement weight training. Your bone cannot rebuild unless you are doing weight-bearing exercise. Your bone needs a stressor in order for those osteoblasts and osteoclasts to stimulate and rebuild. So I combined all of that together. People come at me with how much protein that I recommend because it's certainly not the RDA. And I need to explain to them over and over again that the RDA for protein is to prevent sarcopenia. It's only to prevent deficiency. It is not what we need for optimal driving health. And it certainly isn't the level that we need to heal extreme illness. If you're trying to heal your thyroid or trying to heal you know, a DEXA scan, extreme osteoporosis, devastating diagnosis, which I had over and over again for decades. If you're trying to heal that, you have got to eat in abundance. You, ha you, ha you have to. And the resources that I found that I send to people to back up my recommendations is at least one gram of protein per desired pound of body weight and sometimes 1.5 grams of protein per pound of body weight. I am about 125 pounds now and I eat over 200 grams of protein every day. I have done that for five years and I don't believe that my osteoporosis would have reversed if I had not done that. You cannot rebuild bone without abundance of nutrition. Along with that, I made sure that I took the components that I needed to rebuild bone, which would, would have been selenium and boron and the vitamin D3, K2 and the magnesium. Those are important for bone. And I slowly implemented weight training 
I started from where I was. At that point, I could lift two and five pound weights. That was about it. And I could put five pounds of sand in a backpack to make my own rucksack and do um, walking lunges and squats and to, to start to start putting some pressure on my bones to rebuild bone and, and also to start to rebuild my skeletal muscle. I, I wanted to completely change my body composition, um, which I'm still working on, but uh, it, you know, you're never finished, but I've, I've put on 45 pounds of muscle in five years. And I now, um, I weight train seven days a week with an upper lower body split so that I have a day off for upper and lower body. I work out at home. If I was going to a gym, I probably would not do what I'm doing now. I would probably do three or four days a week and do full body every other day just for convenience of leaving the house and going to a gym and you know working out. But because I'm able to stay motivated and do it at home, it's easy for me to get up in the morning and um, and just you know get it done and go about the rest of my day. But I am now uh, lifting um, dumbbells that are 25 pound as I continue to build more muscle in my arms and back and shoulders with my upper body workout. My uh, my five pound in the backpack broke at 25 pounds a year ago. <laughs> And um, at that point, I had seen so many people on Twitter using an actual weight vest that is better on, on your core, better on your posture, better on abdominal development. So that was my perfect time about a year, year and a half ago to go to a weight vest. So I use a 30 pound weight vest. And that is part of my lower body workout with stairs, walking lunges, squats, you know, different components that I use it for to have that extra 30 pounds and doing a lower body workout. I also have um, a personal home gym. So I use that for lat pull downs, um, 50 to 70 pounds on that. I use it for uh, lower body also. And I work out abs every day. I do uh, 10 or 12 different advanced planks that um, have not only changed abdominal muscle, but it has also alleviated um, chronic low back pain. And I also used to suffer from sciatica and that has all reversed also by prioritizing those exercises that um, strengthen your core and um, strengthen you know, those, that corset of muscles all the way around from the back to the front. So I've benefited that also. And of course, five years ago, I, I couldn't even do a plank. I had to do like a push up against the wall. I couldn't do anything. But you start from where you are. And um, you, know, you find a book or you find a video of, of where you feel like you can start. And you just, you just start there. And when it gets easy, you, you find more advances. And um, it's, 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 it's important to stay active. It's important for your brain health also, because that's where our endorphins and some of our hormone production comes in by staying active and, and by using exercise. I don't think you should do anything that you hate. I mean, you can, you can achieve the same thing by rollerblading, swimming, um, you know, as long as you can put some, some weight in there with it. If, if you like to walk, Wear your weight vest while you're walking. If you if you prefer walking, wear ankle weights, wear wrist weights. You can customize whatever you enjoy doing um, by tweaking it a little bit in order to make it a weight bearing exercise, so that you actually build skeletal muscle and you actually rebuild bone. Wow, yeah, I love I love that um, you started your answer talk talking about um how you supplement for deficiency and i think that that's uh, a point that not enough people are making um there's a lot of charlatans out there trying to sell you this magic pill that magic pill uh, but you know what i started to think about during uh, the beginning of your answer was our bodies 
need particular raw materials in order to function optimally. And if we're deficient in those raw materials, we're not going to function optimally. Um, there's a theory about disease that disease originates from one of two things, or maybe it's both things at the same time that can happen too: deficiency or toxicity, right? Too much is something bad or not enough is something good. Um, you know, I think modern medicine, we talked about that a little bit before, you know, when they think about oh, how do I treat this mental illness or that physical illness, it's like, let's throw a bunch of chemical pills at it and see what happens. Um, that's not really the way to healing, in my opinion. And uh, I think, you know, what you did in your healing journey is so inspiring and and also just a great example of this sort of deficiency toxicity hypothesis uh, of disease. I want to pick up on um, one of the other uh, things that we we started talking about here because I think you know a lot of your healing journey had to do with diet and supplementation, but you've also mentioned sunlight. You've also mentioned sleep. You've also um, mentioned exercise. Uh, I think this is interesting, particularly because uh, Dr. Philip Ovedia posted today on Twitter. I, I don't know if you saw uh, no. a poll uh, saying how many people think that 80% 80, 80 of uh, health is diet. And I actually replied to that post because I've heard Dr. Ken Berry say this as well. And it's one of the few areas that I that I actually disagree with him on. I think diet is by far the most important piece of health. Um, I would say it probably accounts for 40 to 50% of health. But I actually think, you know, some of these other things are massively important. I think it's massively important to get outside and get sunlight. I think it's massively important to get proper sleep. I think it's massively important to exercise. And so I would say those should get, you know, a decent, a decent bit of bit of weight too. Maybe, uh, maybe more than the thirty percent allotment that um, some of these folks are giving it. Where do you see, like, if you were to give advice on on health just generally, where do you see kind of those percentages when it comes to diet versus some of these other lifestyle aspects? I think it's important to start with diet. That's that's the foundation. But like you, I agree that these other components are very important. If you can have your diet and your nutrition on point, but if your stress level is horrible from work or a bad marriage and you're, and you're only sleeping two or three hours at night and you're waking up and you can't go back to sleep and your cortisol levels are through the roof or you're living in a climate that's that's dreary and there's no sunlight and you're not getting the benefit of your circadian rhythm and your melatonin being regulated correctly by being out in the sun and being able to assimilate vitamin D3, which we know is crucial for mental health. It all works together. Um, and, and the exercise component, you, you know, it, it doesn't have to be two hours in the gym every day, but it is important for our body and for our mind to, to get some sort of form of exercise. Some, it, it's just that important. I, and I agree with you that you start with diet, but you need all these other components to work together with it. They're very, very important. I agree. Yeah, this is one of the areas that I really appreciate. Dr. Sean O'Mara talks about it a lot. Uh, you know, he puts up a list during, I think, pretty much every podcast or every uh, uh, video that he, he puts on himself of all of these different things that he thinks people need to do to achieve optimal health. Um, and the list is fairly long. I think there's like probably 10 things on there. Um, and, you know, one of the ideas that Ryan and I had when we started metabolic health is there are a number of different levers that need to be pulled in order to achieve optimal health. And we have six of them. We, we kind of dump everything into six different categories. 
And I think like, there's not enough conversation about some of these things. Like one of the things you talked about earlier um, was, you know, how much, uh, how much it meant to you during your healing journey to have such a supportive and loving husband. Um, you talked about having issues with your, your father. And what that makes me think of is, you know, we, we preach a lot about social connection. Um, social connection is so, so important for optimal human health. If you don't have really, really strong human relationships, you know, that can tank your health. Uh, that alone can tank your health. Um, what is your sort of, uh, what is your opinion about the importance of social connection and what weight would you give that as part of your healing journey? It carries a lot of weight. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up. I just got two direct messages over the last couple of days. A couple of gentlemen had reached out to me for mental health. And part of what they're dealing with is loneliness. They are trying to, to heal mental illness and they're living in a country that they're, that's not their home country. They're living abroad. They're isolated from their friends and family. They don't really know their neighbors and their apartment buildings. Their acquaintances at work are, are not someone that they spend time with socially or it's even worse than that. And they're working remotely from their apartment. And the only time they have interaction socially is when they go to a restaurant or they go to the grocery store. There's no meaningful socialization going on. There's no connection going on. I can help them as much as I can with interventions for food and therapy and supplements to to heal those deficiencies while they're getting their nutrition on point i can't help them with that lack and that intense amount of loneliness like you just said it will literally tank them they are so despondent they are so lonely and living in such isolation it is an extremely important component for mental health um, i am so blessed to have a husband that has stayed with me for 32 years he's only had who i am now for six and Prior to that, he went through his own loneliness because we were married, but I, I was not a resource for him. In a sense, he had his own isolation to deal with and his own mental health suffered. I have seen him how you want to put it, come out of his shell and blossom. The last six years, he, he's he's more talkative, he's more animated, he's he's more um, adventurous because he and I are a source for each other. And I feel so badly when I come across someone like these two gentlemen that direct messaged me that I can't fix that for them. I can't reach across the ocean and be a friend to them to give them the motivation to, to start to try to make other connections to live their life. It's something that we have, to, I think we have to at some point try to push ourselves to doing. I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Dana on on. Twitter and Instagram, I think of him when I think about 
um, putting yourself outside your comfort zone. He talks about this a lot in his interviews that part of his mental health healing that piggybacked off of his weight loss was pushing his own boundaries, was going to activities and social interactions for work, for church, for a, a club that he would join, a hiking club or, you know, whatever, a club that he, he would try to uh, make friends in. He needed to do that in order to break away from some of this isolation. And it, it, I think so, someone is going to have to, it, it isn't something that falls in your lap. If you don't have that support system, you're going to have to read about how important it is and you're going to have to take the steps needed in order to put yourself in those social situations so that you can make connection. We are a social, intimate connection human race and we need connection. I agree. We often uh, think of social connection in terms of interpersonal relationships and in some of your story you've talked about going to church and meeting your husband there and uh, blessings in your life and in your bio even you touch upon um, how your own spirituality was transformed via your metabolic journey would you be able to touch on that a little bit just how maybe your your spiritual relationship uh, has been broadened and deepened as a result of making yourself healthier I'd be glad to. Yes, I certainly can. I, um, I've gone to church most of my life, but I didn't understand a personal relationship with Jesus Christ until I was about 18. At that time, I accepted Christ into my life as my savior, but I lived the next three decades feeling far away, no matter how much I read in the Bible and no matter how much I exposed myself to church and um, even pastors that I followed on television, I felt like there was a wall, that there was a block there. And I felt like his love was there for me and mine for him, but I was not connected. I could not feel his love. The schizoaffective disorder, the voices that I heard blocked that. When the voices left completely, I had a spiritual awakening that I, it's hard to put into words. The self-punishment, the self-hatred, the, the voices were gone. I had an experience that I felt not only filled me, but my cup overflowed. And everything got replaced with love. Everything got replaced with feeling alive and connected to God for the first time in my life that I never knew was even possible. I would watch, as a youngster, I would watch the Billy Graham crusade on TV with my grandparents and seeing the people go forward and praying a prayer to God and asking him to come into their life and seeing an actual change in their demeanor, in their countenance. I was so envious. I had never experienced that. 
I wanted it, but I didn't know how to reach it. And I now know it was the mental illness, the brain disorder that was blocking me from experiencing that. And so I, I have a relationship with Christ as a Christ follower that I never knew was possible. It is not something that is within a church building. It is not something that I need to go externally find and get refueled for the week. It is internal. It is eternal. It is where my joy comes from. And I also know that all of those years that I prayed for him to heal me, I also know that he could have. He could have healed me instantly. There are miraculous healings of instantaneous healings historically and happening today. But he chose not to. And I believe that he chose not to because he kept me alive until I could find my healing through nutrition. If he would have healed me instantly, I wouldn't have no message for anyone else suffering. I can help more people by being healed this way than if he would have healed me instantly. So I am eternally grateful for, for my relationship with him and feeling so alive today and being able to have a message that even if I could help one person, it will be worth it. I promised and vowed to myself that the 40 years that I spent in torment would not be in vain. I was not going to just live the rest of my life hiding this under a bushel. I was going to let my light shine. It wasn't going to be that I was just going to live the rest of my life being healed and not talk about this. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about that if we don't speak about Jesus, that even the rocks will cry out and proclaim him. If we choose to stay silent, that the rocks will even cry out. And I, I like that verse because that applies to me also. I cannot stay silent. If I were to stay silent, I feel like the rocks would cry out. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm compelled. I am compelled to speak about this because of the millions of sufferers out there that need to know that there is a way to heal. Yeah, I love that. And uh, until I saw your bio describing it, I never put it together in my own life, but I've I've definitely uh, improved myself metabolically over the last couple of years. And Mike's even made comments about it because he's known me since college. And um, like, I always had a very intellectual relationship with God. And it wasn't until I got my, I would say my, um, my mental state very stable and consistent um, that I began to be able to have more of an emotional relationship uh, with God. God in turn. So I found that just very interesting that like that health can play such a critical role in spirituality. Um, you talked a bit about uh, magnesium um, earlier and, and just in terms of like evangelizing and helping. I understand that someone very close to you, uh, you were able to help through your research skills that you've cultivated. Uh, would you be able to speak a little bit about that journey of um, metabolic health and wellness that you were able to um, embark on with respect to Tourette's? I certainly can. <laughs> I have um, never, this will be my 13th podcast interview, but I have never spoken about this in an interview and I would, I would be glad to. I have posted about it on Twitter and um, have been able to come alongside quite a few families that have reached out to me for help, um, which has been an absolute honor. When my daughter was six, 20 years ago, I, of course, was in the throes of the deepest, darkest torment of this mental illness. 
she was healthy up until the point where she was about six. And over the course of about three months, she began to have verbal tics and muscle tics that got so violent, she could not hold her head still. And it was awful to watch. It was devastating to have her cry most of the day, and especially at night, trying to go to sleep. The muscle twitches are so exhausting. She was so tired at the end of the day. It's such a, a, a feeling of twitching and cramping and then you're exuding energy trying to stop yourself from doing it so that other people don't look at you funny because you can't control them. She was exhausted. We got to a point where I was taking her to doctors, pediatrician first, and then a neurologist. And the dreaded diagnosis came out of Tourette syndrome. And they, they give you this devastating diagnosis with no hope that it is permanent, that she will have to learn how to live her life this way. She will have to learn how to shun other people's dirty looks. One of the things that she could not control was she rolled her eyes all the time. And when other people would see her do this, they thought she was being disrespectful. They thought she was being mean to them. She suffered greatly socially from this. That's all the doctors could offer were sedatives to try to make her muscles tired because they did not have an answer for why this was happening. They tried to tell me it was genetic. They tried to tell me she was born this way. They, they threw everything at it that they could possibly throw at it to try to get me to accept this. And I was not going to accept that. Not when she was fine for six years, with no hint of this anywhere. And within three months, she was debilitated. I knew that there was something out of balance. I had no idea what it was, but I knew that there had to be something out of balance. At that point in our life, because I was already not eating meat or fat, a lot of what I was cooking for the family was also carb-based for them. We ate a lot of pasta, a lot of, they did, I cooked for them. I didn't eat it, but what I cooked was a lot of pasta, a lot of bread, a lot of noodles, a lot of starches, potatoes, um, even packaged foods, crackers, little fishy crackers. I mean, all those things that you feed to a five, six-year-old as snacks, a lot of, you know, a lot of crackers and <laughs> um, those sorts of things. I, um, I knew that, that there had to be something wrong. So I started on a quest to research and research and research. I spent hours and hours reading. We had just gotten our first computer and um, it was dial up. <laughs> so, you know, you, you hear the little ringing in the background while I was trying to connect and I would stay up many hours of the night searching and searching and searching. I came across, um, that's when I first came across Carolyn Dean, who wrote the groundbreaking book on magnesium. At that time, it was fairly new. 
And as I read articles about her connection and or ordered her book to read it and, and start highlighting in the book, there was a section in there talking about um, muscle cramping that we all know, you know, when our minerals are out of balance and we have a Charlie horse, we have a leg cramp, we have a toe cramp, we have a hand cramp, and we need more magnesium, we need more salt, we need more potassium, we need more water. We know that. She was in this one section of the book talking about that it could actually affect the face. And I was like, wow, really? You know, but that I've never heard that before. So as I plowed through her book and continued my search online, there was a, a set of blog posts. This was, you know, before Facebook, before Instagram, there was a set of parents on a blog post that was kind of an offshoot of Carolyn Dean's book and website. And there was a set of parents that were talking about Tourette's and uncontrollable facial muscle twitches and what they were finding that could work and they would try to go back to their doctors and share what was helping and they would be shut down. They would be told that that's ridiculous. So I did enough research to understand that a body and brain that's deficient, actually clinically deficient in magnesium, even if your blood test for magnesium shows that it's within normal range because your blood will tightly control. You can have all kinds of magnesium deficiency symptoms in your body, but your blood marker will still show that it's within normal ranges. I coupled that information with several of these families that mentioned that there was a connection between magnesium deficiency and foods that were magnesium antagonists. And those foods were wheat, specifically gluten, and dairy. My daughter lived on pasta and dairy, <laughs> pasta and cheese. She, she would go weeks with eating nothing else. And I thought that that was eating healthy. You know, I, I, was, I was cooking this for her. It was, you know, hard dairy cheese. It was, you know, good milk. It was whole wheat pasta that I thought was better than white pasta, which actually is worse in, in the terms of anti-nutrients. So I, I used that knowledge from that couple of set of parents. I needed to verify that. I needed to understand that this was really scientific, that this wasn't just some parent saying that, that wheat and dairy were leaching magnesium out of their child system. So I started looking through nutrition journals online and uh, ordering them to borrow them from the library. And I found all the evidence that I needed. The, the components in both of them, the phytic acid, the leptins, the oxalates, you know, in, in certain foods, which is high in wheat, and the components in dairy with the imbalance of too much calcium that would then take out the magnesium. So I, I had found a lot of evidence on my own through nutritional journals that this actually was right. This was correct. So as, as a six-year-old, we talked about this. I always talked to her and not at her and included her in everything. Because I was I was raising a future adult. I wasn't I wasn't coddling a, a child. <laughs> um, 
I wanted her to grow up to be strong um, in mind and in body. But this was going to be this was going to be rough to explain to a six year old that that in order for you to feel better, we're going to need to take your favorite foods, what you literally live on. But, you know, she doesn't eat anything else. We're going to have to we're going to have to eliminate those and and you're going to need to take magnesium to offset this deficiency. At that point in her life, she couldn't swallow pills. And a couple of these families were using a magnesium citrate powder from a company called Natural Vitality, Calm. And so I thought that that was the way to go. Um, she had also had uh, lifelong issues with constipation, which I now know was another feature of magnesium deficiency. I didn't know it then. I came to quickly realize that that was another thing that she was, that was another telltale sign that she was magnesium deficient. So we embarked on this. Um, I ordered the palm powder and uh, started with a very low dose dissolved in boiling water that she drank at nighttime to get the benefits of relaxing her facial muscles while she slept. And we took away all wheat, all gluten, and all dairy. And within four weeks, Tourette's syndrome was gone, completely gone, just like these families on this blog post had said. And I was floored. I was amazed and floored and thankful, but also angry. <laughs> Angry again at another set of feeling medicalized with no hope when it was nutrition again that made the healing possible. She is now just turned 27, married with a child of her own, and the life that she has. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt would not look like what it looks like if she had been and stayed that six-year-old girl that couldn't function. She would not have the life that she has now. She um, does well with adding wheat and dairy back in now. So she's not only healed to the point of not having symptoms, but she it has healed and healed that deficiency so much with daily magnesium, because she now also takes magnesium three and eight and glycinate, along with some of the calm powder, to have um, even more brain healing effects from those two great forms. And she can eat dairy and wheat and to a certain level and, and have no problems at all. She, um, she's living in freedom. She's happy and healthy. And I think of the thousands of sufferers out there that are living their entire lives whenever they get diagnosed, whether it be as a child or as an adult. And it breaks my heart, absolutely breaks my heart that they could be better if doctors could see past profit and look at people because they can't make a profit off of magnesium and changing their patient's diet. But if they cared about people, they would look into it. And that's what makes me angry. <laughs> well, I appreciate you sharing that. And undoubtedly we'll have listeners that are in different stages of the parenting journey. I only have a six month old, so we can sort of give him whatever we want. And, you know, there's not like a pre existing addiction per se, you, you could call it um, to carbs that you might have to overcome. Um, but the behavior change strategies that you discussed, I think are really helpful for people with maybe older children who have started to already build these habits. 
Um, were there any other strategies during that period of time? I, I know you said that you cut out, um, you know, wheat and, and dairy and a number of things all at once. Um, was it like a cold turkey sort of thing or did you do phasing out with the food types? Um, just curious if, if there were strategies you employed. She was, she was so ill. We did a cold turkey. Um, I was so desperate to find out if this could help her. Uh, and, and she was so distraught from feeling physically so ill to what she was experiencing socially that I felt like rather than transition and see what we could do long term, the best strategy for her was just to jump in and just see what we could we could figure out. It was she was just she was that sick. We we needed to do something immediate. And and nice that it's a four week turnaround as well that you could see the immediate results. Yeah. Well, Larry, you, you've had some amazing results, you know, just between you and and your daughter. Have you had any success going back to some of these doctors that you've seen either for yourself or for your daughter and showing them like, hey, I used to have osteoporosis. Now I don't. Are you interested in how I did that? Hey, I used to have schizophrenia and now I don't. Are you interested in how I got rid of it? Hey, my daughter used to have Tourette syndrome and now she doesn't. Are you interested in you know, how, how she got rid of it? Any success with uh, speaking to doctors about some of these treatment protocols that you followed um, and, uh, you know, just getting them to listen and maybe potentially implement some of these strategies with their patients? No, I have not um, been able to convince anyone to take a look at any of what you just mentioned. I have not gone back to every doctor that I went to. Um, there's too many. <laughs> there's probably close to 50 doctors that I saw over the course of 40 years. I did go back to who I had seen last, my general practitioner, my last psychiatrist, my last de registered dietitian, um, my last hospital inpatient stay. I, I went to the most recent and I felt like if I could make headway and even get one of those five or six to listen, that I would be committed to going back to as many as I possibly could find if they were still in practice to share with them. I never went further than those five or six because I was met with complete resistance. I was met with absolute great for you, but you'll be back. You know, this is whatever you've done is just masking your symptoms. Or I got the, um, well, you're experiencing a placebo effect. You just think that you're better. Or, you know, just those, those two very broad statements that this is either this special restrictive diet is either masking your symptoms and you'll be back to real medicine, to real proper treatment, <laughs> or you're experiencing a placebo effect because you want to be better so badly that you, that you willed it to be. And same thing, you'll be back when things go badly again. Every single one that I went back to was that way. Insane. <laughs> and and what do you think is the root of it? Like, to me, this is a form of like cognitive dissonance here. Just complete uh, inability to come to grips with reality. What is, what is the cause of that? Why won't they listen to you? Um, you're like, why? I think part of it is lack of nutritional training in medical school 
and lack of their own wanting to die deep because we know it can be done. We, we know that medical doctors that have come out of the system and are still practicing, we know that they can learn more. And when you know, know better than you do better. I mean, case in point, Dr. Ken Berry and Dr. Sean Baker and Dr. Philip Avadia, they, they all came from a place of being dispensers of medication and following the standard American diet and thinking that that's, this, is, this is what you do. We know that, that it's possible to come away from that and, and come out and say, I was wrong. And this is the right way. This is the way that I achieve my own health. And this is how I am um, dealing with my patients now. I think it takes someone in the medical field, it takes someone who is not holding on to their ego in order to do that. Because if they allow me and my story and others who have healed, whether it be physical or mental illness, if they allow us to knock a brick out of their wall of knowledge, then the whole entire thing comes crumbling down. Everything that they've been taught, everything that they talk about and advise their patients to do would have to be reevaluated. And that takes humility. That takes being able to admit that you're wrong and for a lot of people, that's not in their in their makeup. They <laughs> they don't admit when they're wrong very easily, and it takes someone who thrives on learning and continues to thrive on learning to be able to come back and do that. That's that's part of why I think it is the way it is. The other part is profit. Doctors make a profit over chemotherapy. They make a profit over medication protocols. They make a profit every time that you are in there every month or two that needs another medication to mitigate the side effects of the medication that was prescribed at the prior office visit. I think the other component is profit. They are not going to make the money that they want by suggesting nutrition first and exercise and sun and all of these things that we know play a role in vibrant health. Yeah, and and in many cases they they tell you the exact opposite of what you should be doing. They say stay out of the sun, right? <laughs> as as a, as an example, um, I think maybe the other component of it is the the medical curriculum. The curriculum that doctors learn in medical school is actually funded by pharmaceutical companies, right. um, and you know I think there are some perverse incentives there uh, to to enrich themselves. And, and that's just kind of the spoon feeding that they get from, from the get-go. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think on top of that, like, you know, if you're taught the wrong fundamentals about disease, we talked earlier about, you know, the, the basis of, of most diseases, obviously there are genetic diseases as well, but the basis of most diseases is deficiency and toxicity. And if you can reverse a deficiency, you can heal diseases. If you can reverse toxicity, you can heal diseases. But that's not how they think about it. Um, curious, in, in the conversations that you've had with some of these doctors, uh, <laughs> I know that there's a number of doctors out there in the Twitterverse. Uh, we don't need to name names. Uh, that you know they tend to have issues with 
uh, eating lots of saturated fat, for example, because it might raise your LDL cholesterol. Did any of these doctors that you spoke to say, oh, I'm, I'm glad you reversed your schizophrenia, but now you have to worry about your LDL cholesterol. And I'm, I'm glad you don't have osteoporosis anymore. But, you know, now you're going to have heart disease. <laughs> like, ha have you gotten that reaction at all? I have. Yes. Yeah, we've, we've gone down the, which is why I haven't been back for five years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I got to a point where I didn't want to have that conversation anymore because we have findings coming out now, you know, every month, every six months, every year that is showing that even when LDL goes up in lean mass hyper responders, it doesn't mean that it's deadly. It doesn't mean that it's bad for us. It just means that it is a, a biomarker that happens when we're lean and we go low carb. So for me, I don't care what my LDL does because what what's what are my two choices? I either have possibly high LDL and I'm mental illness free, or I I lower my LDL and I go back to having mental illness. <laughs> like I that that's not even a choice. What you know that's not even something that that you even entertain. That, that's a that's an easy easy hands down pick to make that I, I don't I don't listen to what you know what those biomarkers are and and even so doctors don't know everything they they just don't I mean you you were talking about even having a genetic disorder I just happened to think I went one of the things I did is I went back to a rheumatologist that because I had a genetic issue I had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and um, I had constant joint pain and injuries and hyperextension and overextension from that. And um, the rheumatologist always told me that it's genetic. You know, it, it will continue to get worse. You, you can't strength train. You can't exercise. You can't overextend. You have to be careful. You will have injuries for the rest of your life. I no longer have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Even when you have a genetic component, that does not mean that it can't be helped. That just means that genetically you have this either predisposition or full-blown illness that still has a component that can be helped. It's a collagen disorder. Well, I spent 40 years not eating any animal protein. Of course, it's going to get worse. Of course, I'm going to have hyperextension <laughs> injuries. I, I was not consuming anything that was supportive of the lack of collagen in my joints. So that first year when I flooded my system, and the second year and the third year, I flooded my system with high quality animal protein and fat, all of these joint pains and these hyperextension injuries that I would get um, to the point where I couldn't even hold mascara in, in my hands because it would send a shooting pain up to my elbow because I had overextended my elbow. It was all gone. It was, and, and when I went back to the rheumatologist to explain hopefully explain and spark their interest that there's a nutrition component that can help Ehlers-Danlos by implementing high quality animal protein and, and connective tissue of whole cuts of meat that will replenish the collagen in your system. She just laughed at me. She just, she just laughed at me. She says, you're, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. And then she and she had been treating me for 10 years and it's on all of my charts. You know, when you when you get done and you have your receipt and it says what she treated you for and, and it says the DSM code and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, EDS. Her next thing out of her mouth at that 
visit, that last visit was, she must have misdiagnosed me. I must not have really had it to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you think is what do you think is our hope for the future uh obviously like you know this this can't continue for much longer the patient population at least in the united states is only getting you know unhealthier and unhealthier by the day seemingly um what's what's our hope for the future how do we change this system i know you uh mentioned rivero earlier um, but kind of like, what do you think are the steps to to get us from A to Z um, into like a new uh, system that actually works? I think I think it's already starting. We have um, several people on Twitter that have put a database together that you can get on. You can you can request it. You can get on there and click your state, and it will give you a list of low-carb, ketogenic carnivore doctors that are popping up that are asking to be put on this database. Dr. Ken Berry has one as well. I think that is the way that we change the trajectory of physical and mental health. It, I don't think it's going to be from the top down. I think it is up to us and the doctors that are opening their eyes. Um, in terms of mental health, there are more than 15 clinical trials going on right now in the United States and abroad. Actual randomized controlled trials that are looking at ketogenic nutrition therapy for mental illness. And that's being spearheaded by Dr. Chris Palmer and the Bazuki Foundation, Jan, Jan Ellison and her husband and their foundation, which who also funded the case series I was in. I think that groundbreaking work between physical illness of, of general practitioners and Revero and the databases that people are putting together and in conjunction with what's going on with mental health, um, Dr. Chris Palmer has just been given, I think, a grant at McLean Hospital to, to run a trial. The, the more we have those things go on, the, the more we have support for that, we can change things from the inside out and from the bottom up. And I think we need to advocate for ourselves and for our spouses and for our families and look to these resources when we do need medical advice so that more business is being given to, to what is actually going to help other people and that will enable it to grow. And I'm, I'm, I'm still hopeful, even though the state of what's currently going on, which makes you feel hopeless, but there are things that are moving in the right direction if we look for them and if we give it our attention. Wow, I love that. I agree with that. I, I love ending on a positive note here. Um, Ryan, I see we're coming up on time here. Uh, did you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I want to thank all listeners for uh, tuning in and enjoying the conversation with us. I want to thank Valerie for sharing her story uh, as well as her daughter's story and just her insights from years of research into fixing her chronic health problems that plagued her and gave her a lower quality of life. And ultimately, she was able to take that life back and even um, spread that joy to people near and far to her. So um, we think that she's just starting on this journey of evangelizing um, her transformation and in turn sparking transformations in other people. And we're just so grateful that we could have you on as a guest. Um, as we conclude, are there any um, social channels or um, Twitter profiles that you would like to uh, share with the audience just so that they know how to better get in touch with you? Definitely. I'm on Twitter or better known as X. <laughs> I still say Twitter uh, and Instagram. Both of them, um, both accounts are the same handle, Valerie Ann 1970. And it's spelled V-A-L-E-R-I-E-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E, 
and then the number 1970, which is the year I was born. And I prioritize direct messages that come in first. I reply to those first. And uh, of course, you know, reply to as many as I possibly can on my posts. So anyone wants to talk to me, I phone counsel, I Zoom counsel, just reach out to me and, and see you know, what I could possibly do to help in any area um, of, of any sort of carnivore, ketogenic, any sort of physical ailment, and of course, mental illness also. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, we appreciate again, everybody's time and uh, we can't wait to see you soon on the next episode of Reimagine Wellness. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you, Michael and Ryan.